All right. So praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, we're, um, last week we talked about uh, uh, going into a revival and praying for a revival, and we're going to soon do our fast uh, beginning of uh, February. And um, this month, as it has been since 1960. 64, 65, um, has been the uh, the uh, National Right to Life um, Month, um, Sanctity of Life Month. It's called two or three different things. It's uh, going on now in Washington, D.C. It will uh, this coming Friday. And our Connie is up there. She's up there every year that I can remember. We've gone up there. And... Uh, and some people might say, well, why are you going up there since they overturned Roe versus Wade? Well, they did that, but uh, things got worse. Um, and, you know, the, the, the devil never quits. And so we're going to talk about a little bit about this because uh, we didn't go up there this year. So this is our uh, presentation regarding the sanctity of human life. Uh, and we include from the cradle to the grave, uh, life is precious. God made life, he created us, and he calls it perfect. He calls us perfect uh, from, from the moment of birth till the moment we uh, pass on and go to heaven to be with him. So life is precious. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit, and I have a pres special presentation that I want to uh, show tonight, and I'm sure you're gonna like it. So let's get moving. Wednesday will mark 47 years since the Supreme Court decided that if you're an unborn human being, you don't get the rights of personhood. So friends, we can't be caught sleeping anymore for our opponents and the enemies of the unborn are engaged in this battle. They are on the battlefield awake and serving their father in attacking unborn children. And we're asleep again. How you act and respond to abortion today, friends, ready? Is exactly how you would have responded to slavery in the 1850s. If our country is going to deny the natural right to life to an entire class of human beings, we cannot trust that government to protect any other rights that sure. flow from that first and most important of all rights. If you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. That is the most fundamental right. Let me tell you something, the pro-life movement is the pro-woman movement because it tells women you do have the inward strength of soul to embrace motherhood for the child you're already a mother to and accomplish everything else as well because you're an image bearer of God with great potential and beauty. If the baby's part of the mother's body, do you know what kind of strange conclusions we have to deal with? Pregnant women must have 20 fingers and 20 toes, two hearts, two brains, two different DNA codes, potentially two different blood types. Oh, and if she's pregnant with a boy, now pregnant women have male genitalia. The womb, the uterus, has become the most dangerous place for a human being to find themselves in America in 2020. You are more at risk of being murdered in a womb than you are residing or living in any dangerous city or crime-ridden slum. From the moment of conception, friends, the unborn child has everything they need to realize their full growth and development as a participating member of the human species. They just need time. This is why Psalm 139 says, Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex, for knitting me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was woven together in the dark of the earth. Fascinating truth. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. How do we love our unborn neighbors? How do we defend them in a crazy, crazy pro-abortion culture that now launches movements called hashtag shout your abortion? If you put your hope anywhere else, you will be let down except in the gospel of Jesus Christ who came as an unborn child to rescue and redeem you, friends. Okay, that was a little um, trailer to what we're going to see in a bit. Um, like I said, this month is, let me get this out of the way, hold on. There's something in my way. Okay. Um, 
So that was a trailer. We'll see uh, more of uh, Seth Gruber in just a moment. Um, so this month is uh, March for Life or Sanctity of Life Month. Uh, this coming Friday is the actual day for the march. It's it's quite something to be involved in, just thousands and thousands of people uh, marching and visiting the offices of the senators and the, uh, the uh, representatives and anybody that we can talk to. And uh, so let me just share my little introduction here. So the annual March for Life is this Friday in Washington, D.C., our Connie Eller is representing there as every year. We have gone and witnessed the magnitude of hope felt in the hearts of the thousands there. We cannot be there this year, but we want you to experience a bit of what it's about. We saw a presentation last week of a young man named Seth Gruber out of Calvary Church in California. Very outspoken, tell it like it is, no holes barred speaker. What he's presenting will leave you in awe and hopefully in an attitude of what can I do? For too long, it seems the only ones who cared about life were the Catholics. I'm praying as part of our quest for revival that this video will light a fire under all of us. Amen. Amen. So, so Seth Gruber is a professional public speaker focused on equipping um, Christians and pro-life advocates to make a gracious, winsome, and uh, persuasive case of their pro-life beliefs in the public square. His approach, while not shying away from the moral question of abortion, focuses on giving you the tools you need to effectively and lovingly engage your coworkers, your family, and your friend, uh, family members on the issue of abortion. And after hearing his presentation, I pray that will happen. So we're going to see um, he has a ministry called the White Rose um, Resistance, and he'll explain how that name came about. And uh, But he is something. It's kind of funny, but he's going to tell it like it is. If you want to grab a pen and a, a piece of paper or something, he's going to give you a lot of references and a lot of things that you can continue to look up when you leave. So uh, when we finish the video, so let's go ahead and start. And I'm gonna run it up about 10 minutes. Sacrifice your sons and daughters to demons and the land is desecrated with blood. A waste. And so, says the Lord in Psalm 106, I give you over to be ruled by those. He was, talk he was talking about what you. was happening when they were sacrificing like their the children. Been being ruled by people who hate us in America and in California for some time now. Is it beyond the pale to ask the question, could it be because of our participation and in intolerance of child sacrifice today? You see, God sees no distinction between killing babies outside the womb and killing them in the womb. We need to be very clear for all these wokey woke pastors and I'm not political Christian leaders who as my pastor Rob McCoy says, wait downstream to pick up human heartache that they helped create through their political apathy upstream. For all the pastors who say, I just preach where the Bible preaches and I'm silent where the Bible's silent and set the word abortion, it's not in scripture. I, I'm a pastor, Seth. I, if it's not in here, I can't preach on it. In Luke 1, when it says the baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb, do you know the Greek word 
that is used to refer to baby John the Baptist, fetus John the Baptist, unborn John the Baptist. It's the Greek word berephos. Okay, turn to Luke 2, and it says, and Mary laid baby Jesus in the manger. So, oh, is, so is this unborn Jesus? No, obviously not. If she's laying baby Jesus in the manger, it's an infant. What Greek word do the authors of scripture use when they were written as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit to refer to Jesus already born? Berephos. Oh, God uses the same word to refer to a baby in the womb as a baby outside the womb. Oh, for pastors and Christians who would see no distinction in value, dignity, and worth between the baby in the womb and the baby outside the womb. Oh, but the Bible's not pro-life, Seth. Really? God couldn't be more clear about what he thinks about life in the womb and child sacrifice. And let me prove it to you. Um, he enters human history in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins. Jesus identifies with you at your most vulnerable stage, the prenatal stage. So in Luke, uh, in Luke uh, 1, you've got the prenatal John the Baptist doing backflips in the womb as he recognizes his savior, the greatest prenatal deity to have ever existed, who entered human history in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins. But because Jesus is a second member of the Trinity and fully God and fully human from the moment of conception, and because God knits life together in the womb, it means that the prenatal deity unborn fetal Jesus is knitting the prenatal John the Baptist together in the womb while he knits himself together in the womb because he is God, which means that he knits himself together in the womb of a woman whose uterus he once knit together when he knit together Mary in the womb of Mary's mother. <laughs> this is called the incarnation. So if you're ever bored or you need some more wonder in your faith, right? Just wake up every morning and dwell on that, right? We'll, we'll, we'll cut that as a reel on Instagram. You can watch it every morning when you wake up and roll out like drunk on the Holy Spirit, like, whoa. Right, I mean, these are beautiful truths. Jesus enters human history in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins. So to be a pro-choice Christian or to vote for the party who slaughters children in the womb because you're personally pro-life, but you don't wanna, you don't wanna um, impose your Christian pro-life views on the broader culture is to commit a Christological heresy because that would maintain that Christ was at some point fully God, but not fully human. So your mantle has fallen off. You've walked away from your authority. And we need more Pastor Jack Hibbs and Rob McCoys in this season to give God a reason to show this country mercy. Brothers and sisters, we have two options before us in this culture war at this moment in California history. We have the, the choice of Lot or the choice of Gideon. I really believe that these are our two options now for the Church of Jesus Christ in America. You see, Lot and Gideon also face their culture wars, <laughs> their political warfare. <laughs> and one of them was like Ed Stetzer, Rick Warren, Tim Keller, Andy Stanley, and the entire liberal establishment and Christian pastors who only speak as much truth as the spirit of the age allows them, lest they lose the ties of the Democrats who attend their church, whose political sensibilities they don't want to offend. <laughs> And the other option, the other option is to be about our father's high kingdom business and give him a reason to show America mercy. So I wanna tell you these two brief stories really quick. Where's Lot in Genesis when the angels come to torch San Francisco, uh, Sodom, <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah? Where is Lot? He's at the city gates. So Lot was the Christian influencer of his day. Lot had a position of authority. You don't put someone at the city gates to welcome the foreigner into your land unless they have respect. He had political influence over the powers of the day. He was a Christian influencer. He probably had a great Instagram following. Life was pretty cush for him. But when the angels come to torch that city, it says what? Lot takes him to his house. And then what does it say? Men from all parts of the city. So from every part of culture comes down and descends on that one righteous man's house. You know the Bible calls Lot a righteous man? And then what do they say? Hey, Lot, bring those men out that we might have sex with them. It's like, wow, now you understand why God wanted to torch Sodom. <laughs> they weren't, well, first they weren't men, they were angels. So it's like, yikes. And Lot comes out, and listen, Lot believed the truth. Lot was sometimes willing to speak the truth. Oops. But when it mattered, 
And when he needed to stand for the truth, he folds like a cheap suit. But he was willing to lob truth out there. What does he do? He goes out on his front porch and he says, brothers and sisters. So he tries to relate to the sexually obsessed mob. Hey, I'm a brother like you, right? Right? Don't kill me. Don't sleep with me. But he says, do not do this wicked or abominable thing. So he calls their actions wicked. He was willing to speak the truth. Oh boy, do we have a lot of Christian pastors and leaders and influencers and authors in America today who will say true things. They're willing to critique wokeness to a certain extent but when they were needed to stand for what is closest to the heart of the father, little babies, the family, they also fold like a cheap suit. So what does Lot say? Here are my daughters. Have sex with them instead. You see, church, Lot was saved, but he wasn't salty. So his wife becomes in death what he should have been in life. A pillar of salt. You can be saved but not salty, huh? You can make it into the kingdom by the hair on your bum. And you can say, "Uh, by grace and grace alone. But what's gonna be your story at the marriage supper of the Lamb? When Gina Gleason and Jack Hibbs and Charlie Kirk and Rob McCoy And all of the pastors who are like Ezekiel's in this season and the pregnancy resource center directors and the love life ministry here and the sidewalk counselors and those speaking at school board meetings are saying, look what God did just because I was obedient. For obedience is better than sacrifice. Or do you want to be like Lot and say, well, uh, um, I gave my daughters to uh, be raped by a mob and God forgave me. The other option is the route of Gideon. And I'll give you some homework this afternoon. When you get home, go read Judges 6. In in Judges 6, do you know where Gideon is? He's hiding out in a cave. Why is he hiding out in a cave? Because they had Bernie Sanders' democratic socialism. (laughs) No joke. No, it was democratic socialism, church. Okay, so it's better than normal socialism, I've, I've been told. Well, remember the Midianites were oppressing the Israelites? And so everything, they thresh their wheat and they make their food and the Midianites come and take it. So Gideon's like, forget this, I'm gonna go thresh my own wheat in a cave. So it's tax evasion, right? <laughs> so Gideon's evading the, you know, the, the taxes and God comes to Gideon in a cave in Judges 6 and he says, mighty man of valor. <laughs> calls him by his identity, calls him higher. Now what's Gideon thinking? <laughs> Where have you been? (laughs) Our grandpapa's told us that you were the God that brought us up out of Egypt. That you would deliver us from the hand of the oppressor. Where's the milk and honey, yo? (laughs) Where's the promised land? This sucks. That's what Gideon's thinking. I thought theocracy. I thought save your people, God. (laughs) What? He, He cooks a meal for God. God lights it on fire, proves he's God. Gideon freaks out. He goes, oh, okay. And then it says, and that same night, So we're talking right after their little conversation. You wanna know God's high kingdom priorities, huh? Judah and Chelsea Smith and Ed Stetzer and Lecrae and Jackie Hill Perry and every other Christian leader that only speaks as much truth as they can get away with without losing their platform and income. You wanna know where God begins his high kingdom priorities? It says, and that same night, God told Gideon, walk out of this cave and you go tear down that altar to Baal, and you take that Asherah pole and you chop that up too, then we'll talk. Well, who was Baal, church? The god of baby sacrifice. And who was Asherah? The goddess of sex. And they would worship Asherah through orgies and unbridled sexual escapades, which nine months later results in an unwanted baby, (laughs) which you then pass through the fire to Baal. What if I told you the strategy has never changed? 
What if I told you there's nothing new under the sun? And as it was in Judges 6, so it is today. Planned Parenthood and the spirit of the age and his acolytes have used the same Judges 6 strategy for decades. They push pornographic, sexually titillating material and curriculum onto young kids to break down their sexual and societal mores and standards to reduce them to their most animalistic appetites so they can't govern themselves, so they'll have more sex, so that more unwanted babies will be produced, which you can then pass through the fires to Planned Parenthood today. Gideon is facing the same culture war that we're facing today that so many pastors refuse to engage on because they, I don't really do the culture war, I just preach the gospel. No, you preach a syncretist, cheap grace gospel to ensure that you don't lose any ties from the people in your congregation who you refuse to call to repentance. God begins with the Israelites' abortions before he begins with anything else. You go tear down that altar of baby sacrifice. How about that? How about then we'll have a conversation? Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I'm about to share some things with you that most churches in this country have never heard before. Most Christian schools have never heard before. We do not understand the strategy of the enemy, nor the people that the enemy of our souls has used to advance his ideology. G.K. Chesterton once said, happy is he who knows not only the hidden causes of things, but who has not lost touch with their beginnings. I know it's a little early for Chesterton. I mean, Chesterton was like, you know. Let me say that again. (laughs) Happy is he who knows not only the hidden causes of things, but who has not lost touch with their beginnings. In other words, happy is he who knows how we got here, who can return to those ancient pagan demonic ideas that were planted in the cultural soil by political elites and the high priests of secular progressivism that contended through their long walk through the institutions to put their ideas, their worldview, and the people who would advocate for those ideas in the public square, in political seats, in positions of influence, while we stood by the sidelines and said, I'm not political. And then we launch our 501c3s and our ministries of mercy to care for the broken people whose heartache we could have prevented if we had been contending upstream from once these ideas come. That's what G.K. Chesterton is saying. But we do not understand the strategy of the enemy. We do not understand how Judges 6 has become the cultural linchpin of the Marxist revolution in America today. We've been fulfilling G.K. Chesterton's prophetic warning when he said, unless a man becomes the enemy of an evil, he will not even become its slave, but rather its champion. I know, I know, Mm, you have to chew on that one a little bit. Unless a man becomes the enemy of that evil over there, he won't even become the slave of the evil that he tolerates, he will turn into its champion. There's no such thing as moral neutrality. If you stand in the middle of the road, you'll get run over by a truck. So, how did we get here? For goodness sakes. Who could have predicted the cultural climate in America in 2022 right now when I was born in 1991? You know all the the slippery slope conservatives, right? Like with with Obergefell, you know, that there's a right to gay marriage or something. They were like, uh, we were like, uh, next thing you're gonna try to do like thruples and polyamorous unions, and you'll want to call that marriage. And they're pushing for it right now. In the sexual revolution, we were like, if you start inculcating the society and propagandizing birth control, next thing you know, it'll be abortions. Next thing you know, it'll be no-fault divorce. And all of the political elites smeared the conservatives with our slippery slope argument. Oh, you stupid tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. Where is the bottom of this slippery slope? You could not have predicted the culture in America right now when I was born in 1991. How did we get here? Much of the cultural and societal rot we're experiencing is due to one of the patron saints of feminism. Her name is Margaret Sanger, the founder of the American Birth Control League, later renamed Planned Parenthood. So if we're going to understand how we got here, we need to return to those early cultural and political revolutionaries who had a more robust liturgy and religion 
than most Christians did. Of course, it was not pure and undefiled religion, but it was a religion, and it had creeds, and it had a sacrament, and it had liturgies, and they were more dogmatic about their religion than most Christians are for ours. In the early 1900s, Margaret Sanger begins to be radicalized by actual communists and socialists in the New York labor movement in the early 1900s. This is where Margaret Sanger, the patron saint of feminism, gets her beginning. And you need to understand who this woman is if we're to understand why Prop 1 happened, if we're to understand why pro-life OBGYNs are now being told, if you won't perform an abortions, we're gonna sue you for pregnancy discrimination. If, we, if you want to understand why Corrine Jean-Pierre, who replaced Circle Back Saki and the White House press secretary, is labeling Christians, pro-life, and conservatives as domestic terrorists and the greatest and most extreme threat to freedom and democracy, if you want to know why the FBI has arrested over 11 pro-lifers in the last six weeks for breaking no laws, but because they're a pain in the butt, a stick in the eye, and a fly in the ointment to the liberal establishment, which is built on the mutilated bodies of 65 million children, if you want to understand all of this, we have to go to Margaret Sanger and all of her friends and influences in the culture wars, which was really just a proxy war for the deeper spiritual war. So Sanger believed that if you wanted to revolutionize society, you had to break down healthy standards and norms. She understood that you couldn't usher in the Marxist revolution, the social revolution, unless you started with the sexual revolution. Do you follow me? because sex is so fundamental to who man and woman is. It's what C.S. Lewis said, the head rules the belly through the chest. So the abolition of man is men without chests. The head is the intellect, the belly is the animal, the chest is virtue, honor, and morality. Men without chests means that the head rules the belly with nothing to temper it in between. And are human beings good at rationalizing their sinful decisions and justifying it up in their mind? Yes, remove the chest, you can do anything you wanna do. Margaret Sanger's goal was to create men without chess, to usher in relativism and sexually titillating material, to break down those healthy societal norms and standards so people couldn't govern themselves and they'd be a sucker for the first would-be tyrant and his utopian promises that rises among them. Do you understand now? So she begins to write and encourage sexual chaos and birth control which convinced Americans that consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy, that we can separate those things. And so if I'm on birth control, then I didn't consent to pregnancy, so therefore I have the right to abort the child because I didn't consent to this baby. So in 1914, Margaret Sanger writes her first published materials. This is where we start to see her ideas in a published public format for the first time. And her first paper was called Woman Rebel. Woman Rebel with the tagline, no gods and no masters. Oh, oh, so, oh okay, so, so the Garden of Eden. So the first lie. Eat the apple, get woke, God's holding out on you. If you eat the apple, your eyes will be opened because God's keeping them closed because he hates you, he's not showing you true reality. And then if you eat the apple, ye shall be as gods. Oh, no gods and no masters, I'm my own God. This is where Margaret Sanger gets her beginning. Here's what she said. Rebel women claim the following rights. The right to be lazy. Oh yes. I forgot to insert laugh track. If you think we made her look like a demon now, just wait in a few minutes. Rebel women claim the following rights, the right to be lazy, the right to be an unmarried mother, the right to destroy, and the right to love. Her publications on sexual liberation, the social revolution, um, and she even defended the need for political assassinations, eventually got her indicted on three counts for breaking the Comstock laws in New York, which prevented you from sending this kind of pornographic titillating material through the Postal Service. And it gave the Postal Service the right to go through the mail and remo remove such material. So rather than being arrested, guess what Sanger does? This is where she gets her beginning, you ready? She ships her kids off to be raised by someone else. She has her socialist friends in the New York labor movement forge her a passport and she flees to England. This is where the founder of Planned Parenthood gets her beginning. She gets more radicalized by the people she meets in England than she was in New York. And she meets the Neo-Malthusians. The Neo-Malthusians. Okay, well, what is it? what's that? Malthusian, Thomas Malthus. Malthusianism. Okay, so who was Thomas Malthus? If, if, if she met his disciples and was influenced by their ideas before she would come back to New York and open up her first illegal, illegal birth control clinic, then who, what was Malthusianism? Well, here's Thomas Malthus. Um, he was an early 19th century Anthony Fauci. Don't worry, guys, he was just following the science. 
Yeah, he was a public health student, he was a scientist, just, you know, just explaining the science and the data and everything. Um, except he just really hated, I don't know, Jews, Slavs, Italians, and blacks. Oh, and the poor and the mentally and physically unfit. And so Thomas Malthus believed that food production can't keep up with population growth, with the inevitable result being massive starvation. Anyone notice the liberal establishment's obsession with overpopulation today? Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, George Soros, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the entire Democrat Party, who peddle, we have too many people! By the way, ever heard of the book, The Population Bomb? Written in 1964 by Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich was a board member for Planned Parenthood. Hmm. And he was repeating the same Thomas Malthus ideas from the early 1800s. So here's a little bit of what Thomas Malthus believed. Okay, you ready? This is from his magnum opus, an essay on the principle of population. All children born beyond what would be required to keep up the population to a desired level must necessarily perish, unless room be made for them by the deaths of grown persons. So we should facilitate, instead of foolishly and vainly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature in producing this mortality. And if we dread the too frequent visitation of the horrid form of famine, we should encourage the other forms of destruction which we compel nature to use. Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets more narrow. We should crowd more people into the houses to court the return of the plague. In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools and particularly encourage settlements in all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, <laughs> we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases and restrain those benevolent but much mistaken men who thought they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. Okay, can I summarize that for you? Some people are good and some people are bad. We need more of the good people and less of the bad people. The bad people have bad genes, and eugenics means good in birth, which means some people are good in birth and some people are bad in birth. And so there are certain genes that we just don't really want reproducing through the gene pool. So if you have like a, a mental disability or a physical disability, or if you're like a Jew, a Slav, an Italian, or a black, and people we don't really want having more kids, then we need to encourage um, we need to encourage the destruction of those people and make sure that they're sterilized so they can't have more kids. This is where much of the overpopulation obs obsession by leftist theocrats actually begins. And these are the people that Margaret Sanger meets in her exile in England. Then she meets a man named Havelock Ellis. Okay, so remember my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I I'm trying to explain to you how the religious priests of humanism were more devoted to their religion than we were to ours. So then she meets a man named Havelock Ellis. Who's ever heard of Alfred Kinsey? Love that, love that. Uh, not enough people, I'll talk to Jack about that, that's okay. Um, Alfred Kinsey was a pornographic, sexually degenerate, obsessed demon. Um, who, who started the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, which is still there. By the way, Indiana University just erected a new statue in the last two months to honor Alfred Kinsey on their campus. Uh, he, he interviewed pedophiles in jail who had raped children between 12 months old and seven years old and documented their rape in charts and timed their orgasms, and he published this material. This is, okay, I can't really go beyond that. That's Alfred Kinsey. Well, Havelock Ellis was the English alternative to Alfred Kinsey. Havelock Ellis wrote over 50 books on every form of sexually lewd, titillating material. He himself was impotent, so he was always trying to find new ways to get excited. That's the PG-13 version. So he meets Margaret Sanger. By the way, Margaret Sanger sleeps her way up the levers of power in England. She slept with H.G. Wells, uh, Havelock Ellis, and many others. Havelock Ellis said, hey, Sanger, your, 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 your rhetoric's a little too radical, but listen, I believe it too. I want you to be successful, but you need to tone down the more radical-sounding themes of communism and anarchism, and you need to focus on the more scientific-sounding themes of eugenics and Malthusianism. So she, he becomes a mentor to Havelock Ellis. Okay, Havelock Ellis had a mentor named Francis Galton. Francis Galton coined the term eugenics. Francis Galton invents the term. <laughs> eugenics. Some people are good and some people are bad, so we need to encourage more good people to have kids and the bad people not to have kids. Okay. Francis Galton, you see, mentored Havelock Ellis. Guess who Francis Galton's half-cousin was? Charles Darwin. <laughs> right. Survival of the fittest. We're no more valuable than animals. PETA's vision is true. We don't have any more dignity than the, the cow, the dog, or the cat. There is no sanctity of life. There is no human exceptionalism. Therefore, the strong will survive and the weak will die. Might makes right in the religion of humanism. 
Francis Schaeffer once said that humanism is the placing of man at the center of all things and making him the measure of all things. In other words, ye shall be as gods, <laughs> okay? So you've got Charles Darwin, whose ideology is responsible for more bloodshed in the 20th century than in all of world history combined before that, whose cousin Francis Galton modernizes the eugenics movement who mentors Havelock Dallas, who becomes the number one mentor to Margaret Sanger before she goes back to New York to open up her first illegal birth control clinics. Hey, maybe the culture war was just a proxy war for the spiritual war. And by the way, they're still obsessed with this idea of overpopulation, right? You had to kill the babies, right? This is why Bernie Sanders, two years ago, at the climate catastrophe town hall, wait, said, one of the solutions to, climate, to fighting climate change is to fund abortions in poor black countries. Bernie Sanders said this on national television. I'll never forget it. I covered it in my podcast. By the way, my podcast is called Unaborted with Seth Gruber because we're all unaborted. So, uh, you know, pull out your phone, subscribe, leave us five stars. You know, help, you know, I'll pull the Charlie Kirk strategy here. You know, it actually helps us beat a ton of people and the show shows up everywhere. Um, so, Bernie Sanders says, okay, so, uh, yeah, we have too many people, right? Malthusianism. There's not enough resources to keep up with population growth. But by the way, have you ever noticed how these, these communist degenerates like Bernie Sanders never volunteer to suicide themselves? <laughs> it's the same thing with all the people who peddle climate change lies who fly on private, private jets everywhere. It's like you obviously don't believe what you're saying. If we have so many people and you believe some people need to be killed, why don't you start with yourself? But it's always poorer and blacker people and darker of skin. It's a fascinating aspect of progressivism today. So <laughs> he says, yeah, it's too many people, so we gotta kill the babies, right? How is this any different than the Aztecs in 1484, right before Columbus shows up, who at the Temple Mayor at Tenochtitlan ritually sacrificed thousands of people over a three-day period, and they would take knives and slice the chest of their victims open, yank out the heart, and, and hold it up to their sun god, Huitzilopochtli. By the way, the other Aztec sun god was named Tisla Topoca, and we have California legislation in our public schools where public high school students were required to chant Aztec chants to Tisla Topoca. And I actually have a video of this of a public high school in California whose public school teachers were leading Aztec chants to Tisla to polka for social justice warrior chants. So once again, hey, maybe this was always just a spiritual war <laughs> that masqueraded as just the politics to keep the politically impotent pastors silent. Anyways, I digress. So how is this any different than them? Because they believe Huitzilopochtli, their sun god, listen to this, was fighting a constant war against darkness. And if Huitzilopochtli ever lost that war against darkness, then the sun would stop moving across the sky. And it, the world would be plunged into a cold, cold darkness, and everyone would die. This is what the Aztecs believe. So they, they believe, oh, humans, we have to sacrifice humans to, to Huitzilopochtli to satiate him and, and fund his war against darkness. How is that any different than Bernie Sanders and the entire liberal establishment today who says the sun god's really angry with us and overpopulation is harming the environment, which is causing climate change, and if we don't significantly curb overpopulation, the sun will cease to shine and move across the sky. The world will be plunged into a cold, cold darkness and everyone will die. <laughs> They're still pushing human sacrifice to pagan deities today with the same belief. So this is who Margaret Sanger's best friends were, wow. She returns to America, she opens up her illegal birth control clinic and begins to propagandize birth control in black enclaves in New York City. Right. She launches her birth control league and she launches her American birth control review, her publication, where she shares her ideas and the ideas of her friends all around the world who were part of the eugenics movement. Sanger actually coined the term birth control. Kind of interesting. Now, I'm not here today to do an entire sermon on birth control. I actually respect the Catholic position against birth control. Come, come talk to me about it afterwards. But I just want you to know, isn't that kind of interesting? The woman who coins the term birth control wanted to use it to prevent people she didn't like from reproducing. Here's what she said. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house built upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising streams of the unfit. Don't forget that word, by the way, okay? Unfit, it's, it's the, probably the central most important word in the ideology of eugenics, because some people are unfit to live, and some people are fit to live. And usually it's rich white people, and people with good genes, believe Margaret Sanger. So she tried to merge the American Birth Control League with major eugenics organizations on two different occasions. By the way, the American Birth Control League had their offices in the same office space as the American Eugenics Society. 
So Sanger's like heading into work, sipping lattes, hanging out with the founders and presidents of the American Eugenics Society. <laughs> so this is what this movement was wrapped up in. Ideas have consequences, huh? And bad ideas have victims. So she publishes her first book, The Pivot of Civilization, in 1922, and Sanger wrote about how she longed, she longed for when the choking human undergrowth of morons and imbeciles would be segregated and sterilized, end quote. Segregated and sterilized. Her great inspiration was this, to create a race of thoroughbreds by encouraging more children from the fit and less from the unfit. I told you that word was important. Some people aren't fit to live and we shall be as gods. <laughs> so we get to decide who has value and who should have a right to life and who shouldn't. As she put it at a 1921 International Eugenics Congress in New York City, quote, the most urgent problem today is how to limit the overfertility of the mentally and physically defective. <laughs> okay. And then in 1925, she starts hosting conferences eugenics conferences and inviting people from all around the world to share their ideas on eugenics. Guys, 100 years ago, following the science just meant being a eugenicist. You need to understand this. Eugenics was, was accepted as the scientific norm 100 years ago, and those laws were dominating much of American state's laws as well that mandated sterilizations for those deemed unfit to live. So here's what Sanger said. The government of the United States deliberately encourages and even makes necessary by its laws the breeding with a breakneck rapidity of idiots, defectives, diseased, feeble-minded, and criminal classes. Billions of dollars are expensed by our state and federal governments and by private charities and philanthropies for the care the maintenance and the perpetuation of these classes, year by year, more money is expensed to maintain an increasing race of morons, which threatens the very foundation of our civilization. And then at the 1925 Sanger Birth Control Conference, they would say, it's the dullard, it's the gawk, the numbskull, the simpleton, the weakling, and the scatterbrain are amongst us. Intermarrying? breeding, inordinately prolific, literally threatening to overwhelm the world with their useless and terrifying get. Wow. Now remember that Malthusian ethic that said, we need to stop the charities and the ministries of mercy because they're actually preventing the poor and the defectives from you know, just expiring into human oblivion. We don't want those people having kids. Sanger would repeat that same Neo-Malthusian line because she was influenced by the same people and she would go after 501c3s and private charities. Here you go, here's Sanger. Organized charity is the symptom of a malignant social disease. You know, those vast complex interrelated organizations aiming to control and to diminish the spread of misery and destitution? Those ministries are the surest sign that our civilization has bred, is breeding, and is perpetuating constantly increasing numbers of defectives, delinquents, and dependents. My criticism, therefore, is not directed at the failure of philanthropy, but rather at its success. <laughs> These dangers inherent in the very idea of humanitarianism and altruism, dangers which have today produced their full harvest of human waste. Now you see why we made her look like a demon, huh? All right, pastors, do we have any barf bags? Do we need to distribute any? Is everyone okay? Are you following with me? Okay. All right, ready for the racism? As if it's not bad enough? Well, in 1939, Margaret Sanger launches the Negro Project. Yeah, that's what she called it. Now, why would you call it that, church? Don't worry, she's not a racist. She was just a woman of her times. I'm sure that calling her project the Negro Project had nothing to do with her deeper eugenic racist ideals. The proposal asserted the following. You ready? Here's where she starts. The mass of Negroes, particularly in the South, still breed carelessly and disastrously, with the result that the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from that portion of the population least intelligent and fit. <laughs> wow! Okay, so if that was the problem, what was the solution? Ready? You, you can go Reuters, fact check me, Washington Post, five Pinocchios, you can fact check all this stuff, all right? Here's the goal of the Negro Project. The gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks, those human weeds, 
which threatened the blossoming of the finest flowers of American civilization. Defective stocks, human, hu oh, hu right, human weeds, because they're not fit to live. Black, Slavs, Italians, Jews, mentally and physically defective, those with bad genes. So guess what she said? Well, we need to get color people to propagandize our message and actually run it so that the black people we're targeting for extermination will be less suspicious of our deeper agenda because it will be run by people who look like them. What if I told you the strategy is the same today? With Planned Parenthood, it has 79% of their surgical abortion facilities within walking distance of majority black neighborhoods, and then they will only hire black people at the front desk of those Planned Parenthoods in black enclaves so that the black babies who dwell in the wombs of their mothers who are walking in will be less suspicious when they see someone who looks like them. So she wrote a letter to Dr. Clarence Gamble. This is probably the one you're familiar with. It's the most famous. We propose to hire three or four colored ministers preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. Because we do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the black minister, he's the one who can straighten out that idea if it occurs to any more of his rebellious members. <laughs> Hey, 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 black pastors. Hey, black pastors of major charismatic black run churches in America. Hey, can you just like peddle Democrat party lies about birth control and abortion so that you continue to vote for the very party that wants to lynch you in the womb and exterminate you? Because then we'll be more effective because people will feel more comfortable because they won't think that someone who looks like them would be helping lead a campaign to exterminate them. How is that any different today than in the major, uh, sadly and tragically, the majority of all black churches in America today are tools for the Democrat Party campaign, which was built by Margaret Sanger's vision, which is alive and welcome, and not just in the halls of academia, but in, in the churches today. So guess what Sanger does? Well, we got to hire Negro project directors. I can't do this by myself. I need help. So she raised up regional coordinators, Negro project directors at the community level and we have some of their writings. Is everyone awake? Are y'all following me? Do we need any Americanos or lattes distributed? Okay, here you go, ready for this? If you haven't barfed yet, get ready. Here's what a Negro project director said. There is a great danger that we will fail because the Negroes think that this is a plan for their extermination. So, so, let's appear to let the colored run it. <laughs> Everything I just told you about, unfortunately, black charismatic Christian leaders that prop up the genocidal agenda against black people, that was being planned by Negro Project directors in the 1930s. Hey, let's just make them think they run it. Here was another Negro Project director. I wonder if Southern darkies can ever be entrusted with a clinic. Now wait, who calls black people Southern darkies? <laughs> Racist. I wonder if Southern darkies can ever be entrusted with a clinic because our experience causes us to doubt their ability to work. Well, of course, except under white supervision. <laughs> <sighs> Margaret Sanger's priests, her pontiffs of the religion of humanism, would seek to upend society and recreate it in their own image. The entire operation was a ruse. It was a manipulative attempt to get blacks to cooperate in their own elimination. And that project was largely successful. As my friend Dr. George Grant says, its genocidal intentions were carefully camouflaged beneath several layers of condescending social service rhetoric and organizational expertise. In other words, follow the science. Margaret's dream was being fulfilled, church. And here's how she put it in her book. Discouraging the defective and diseased elements of humanity from their reckless, an irresponsible swarming and spawning. The ultimate assault against the Imago Dei and those created in the image of God. But where was the church? Oh, we weren't political, praise God. Sanger had some friends. I'll do this quickly. Lothrop Stoddard, a board member of the American Birth Control League, later renamed Planned Parenthood. Here's something about Lothrop Stoddard. He wrote a book called The Rising Tide of Color against white world supremacy. That was the title of his book. He sat on her board. Oh, he was a high official of the Massachusetts Ku Klux Klan. 
Oh, so that's nice. Then he wrote a book called The Rise of the Underman. Who's, who's the underman, guys? Uh, blacks and Jews. And then Adolf Hitler's chief racial theorist, Alfred Rosenberg. Oh, we got some woke, informed Christians in there. Okay? They're like, I know him. Alfred Rosenberg appropriates the English version of his book to the German term Untermensch. Untermensch also means subhuman and was the title of Heinrich Himmler's famous Nazi propaganda book. Guys, the Nazis got the term Untermensch from the English version of Margaret Sanger's board member's book. And then so Lothrop Stoddard goes on a journalistic tour in Germany in the early 40s, and he interviews Himmler, and he interviews Hitler, and was given great journalistic preferential treatment because the Nazis knew that he was on the same team. He was once called one of the spiritual fathers of Nazi Germany. That was from Hans Gunther, a race anthropologist in Germany who referred to Lothrop Stoddard as one of the spiritual fathers of Nazi Germany. Then there was Leon Whitney, the executive secretary of the American Eugenics Society, who remember shared office spaces with the American Birth Control League. <laughs> so Leon Whitney would write in Sanger's Review, where she published her ideas. He wrote a piece called Selective Sterilization. Selective sterilization, right? Because not everyone should be sterilized, just the unfit, right? And in that piece, he praised and defended the Third Reich's pre-Holocaust race purification programs. Now, did, did you just get to write in Sanger's Review whenever you wanted? No, you had to be invited to write. Who invited him to write? <laughs> Margaret Sanger. Then Leon Whitney's friend, Madison Grant, was a leader of the American Eugenic Society. Madison Grant. Madison Grant once put a black man in a cage with a monkey at the New York City Bronx Zoo to quote, illustrate evolution. Here's what Madison Grant wrote in his book, The Passing of the Great Race in 1916. Here's Madison Grant, one of Sanger's allies. Mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and your sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life. Those beliefs tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults who are of themselves of no value to the community. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is only valuable when it is of use to the community or race. Madison Grant. Then Madison Grant, that guy, he got a letter in the mail one day from a German corporal recently out of prison and rising in the German political scene. And he called Madison Grant's book his Bible. And he takes the letter to Leon Whitney, the guy who wrote the selective sterilization piece that praised the Third Reich's pre-Holocaust race purification programs, and he says, hey Leon, <laughs> our writings are influencing the Germans. Leon Whitney smiles and chuckles and pulls out his own letter he had just received from the same German corporal, recently out of prison, and rising in the German political scene. And they start celebrating that their American eugenics ideas are influencing the Germans. The man who wrote those letters was named Adolf Hitler. Wow. Hmm. Then there was Ernst Rudin, who wrote a piece in Sanger's Review called Eugenic Sterilization, an Urgent Need. And in that book, he praises the Nazi eugenics legislation laws, and guess who Ernst Rudin was at this time writing for Margaret Sanger? None other than Hitler's director of genetic sterilization. Okay, wow, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. 100 years ago, Following the science meant being a eugenicist. In America, from Harvard to Princeton, to Nobel Prize winning scientists, to the American Museum of Natural History, to Supreme Court justices, eugenics was believed to just be the inevitable arc of the moral universe bending towards justice and peace. So much so that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's heard that name? Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, in the 1927 court opinion, Buck versus Bell, that was an 8-1 decision, 8-1, that upheld Virginia's mandated sterilization laws of those deemed unfit to reproduce. 
Here's how Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in America in 1927 summed up the science of his day. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So you need to understand this was not just a Germany thing. You understand that? We had sterilization eugenics laws in America. Within 10 years, you had laws mandating the sterilization of those considered a threat to the gene pool. Alcoholics, criminals, immigrants, and African Americans passed in 32 different states in America. And it's estimated that at least 70,000 people were forcibly sterilized from California to New York. Now, lest you think I'm jesting, Henry Osborne, a paleontologist and the co-founder of the American Eugenics Society, okay? Henry Osborne, so he's a paleo, so he loved the dinosaurs, but he hated humans. Yeah, welcome to secular progressivism today where they love animals more than people. Do you, do you see, this, this is not new, this is very old. Here's what he said. As science has enlightened the government in the prevention and spread of disease, it must also enlighten government in the prevention of the spread and multiplication of worthless members of society. Hillary Clinton would call those deplorables and irredeemables. Joe Biden and Karine Jean-Pierre would call that domestic terrorists and the greatest and most extreme threat to freedom and democracy. Do you see that we're living through the next iteration of the eugenics ideas that these secular progressive priests were planting into the soil of the republic for decades? It was the unborn, and now it's anyone who would stand against the killing of those children. Why is this? Because abortion is the sacrament of the religion of secular progressivism. You need to understand this. Pastors who refuse to engage this issue are actually refusing to preach against false religion because abortion says, you must die so I can live. But Christ says, no, I must die so you can live. I die and I'm killed and I raise from death so you can too, so repent and believe you will be saved and be used to accomplish miracles on this world and earth. Peter Kraft, the Catholic philosopher, put it better than I've heard any Protestant ever put it, when he said abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist. That's why it uses the same holy words. This is my body. But with the opposite, blasphemous meaning. So what does Christ say in the upper room? at the Last Supper and the First Communion, this is my body, and I, I break it for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. What if I told you it's not ironic and it's not a coincidence that the central phrase that is the linchpin of the entire secular progressive project are the words, this is my body, my choice and I'll kill whatever's inside of my body because the serpent told me in Genesis 3, ye shall be as gods. And a god gets to decide who lives and who dies. But a god also gets to live forever, right? That's what makes a god a god, they're eternal. This is why we kill babies through embryonic stem cell research, fetal organ harvesting, and most recently, prenatal gene editing. They're doing this in America right now. They're trying to edit the genes of little babies conceived in test tubes and grow them past 14 days in the lab so that if they can perfect gene editing and kill the little babies in doing so, they can apply it on adults when it's safe, of course, because we don't want to compromise our own rights and health, and we can edit out of our gene code certain susceptibilities to diseases and disorders so we can live just a little bit longer. Abortion is the pagan replacement for man's pursuit of eternal life. Rather than accepting the broken body and shed blood of Christ for eternal life, they demand that we break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. You know, if, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Man is fundamentally a religious being. You displace Christianity and weird, kooky other pagan religions will enter its place. And Margaret Sanger understood this. That's why she wanted to use the sexual revolution to usher in the social revolution and displace Christianity as the dominant worldview in America. The only man to see all of this in the early 1900s from an unprecedented, prescient playing field and prophetic vision was a man named G.K. Chesterton. I call him the first lib-triggering troll. <laughs> Truly, before Trump, even before Reagan. 
G.K. Chesterton knew how to troll the left in their ideas, make a public spectacle of them, make their ideas a laughing stock. But shame on the churches in America in the early 1920s when Margaret Sanger was beginning her religious vision that the only man who would see that and warn and warn and say, do you see where this is going? Was one man and today he's credited as one of the only people to be publicly outspoken against these things. Chesterton once said, if Darwinism was the doctrine of the survival of the fittest, then eugenics was the doctrine of the survival of the nastiest. <laughs> So Chestertonian, because who's alive behind the project and aims of eugenics? Some of the nastiest people you could possibly imagine. The kind of people who look at it like Nick Vujicic and say, oh, I don't want him to have kids. Oh, he doesn't have any limbs. The kind of people who look at Down syndrome children and adults and say, they should not be allowed to reproduce. We don't want any more of them. The people who look at blacks, Jews, Italians, and Slavs, the poor, the mentally defective, the alcoholics, the criminal class, and say, oh, it would be better for all of us if they didn't exist. And Chesterton saw it all. He referred to the eugenicists of his day the way we should refer to the eugenicists of our day. When he said, they combine a hardening of the heart with a sympathetic softening of the head because these ideas are stupid, they are ridicule worthy, but they will contend for those ideas nonetheless. And you will be the next iteration of those deemed unfit to live until you stand in the middle of the road of the culture of death with a big sign that says stop and be like a Gideon instead of a lot. We are in a late hour of this American culture war. You do not label your political opponents domestic terrorists unless you seek to see them treated as such. And if you dare be like Gideon and stand against the sacrament of Satan and the secular progressive religion, you will also be defined as unfit to live. So you need to understand abortion is not detached from the secular progressive moral revolution. It actually plays the central role in the entire Marxist revolutionary takeover. So when people say, Seth, I love your pro-life heart and calling, but I'm called to other battlefronts. By the way, praise God, I would never tell you to abandon a calling God put on your life to become a full-time pro-life activist, though God may be calling some of you to become full-time love life missionaries at this church, to tear down the high places of Moloch in California. But if you're not called to that full-time, that's okay, but you can't neglect this battlefront because it plays the, the central role. It's actually the linchpin upon which secular progressivism swings. And if you remove that linchpin, the entire liberal establishment begins to collapse in on itself like a dying star. Which was why when Roe v. Wade got overturned on June 24th, 2022, all of the CNN and activist media headlines, by the way, I call them journalistic prostitutes for the culture of death, all of their chirons and headlines were like, the GOP is coming for all of our rights. They were saying things like, without abortion, they're gonna come for everything else. It was very interesting. It was one of the most important lessons for the church right after the overturning of Roe was to watch the headlines and commentary from Moloch Serviles. Oh, I'm sorry, I mean, political pundits on the left. <laughs> Freudian slip. So when you say one thing and mean your mother. What they were telling us is they were saying, without abortion, we don't know what to do anymore. Right. Mm. It's not just one feature of progressivism. It is the sacrament, the centerpiece, and the linchpin. And when we refuse to be like Gideon, we should not complain and whine when one day we're defined as the next iteration of those deemed unfit to live. With almost unparalleled political vision, Chesterton wrote in 1920, listen, listen, church, this is one year before Sanger launches her American Birth Control League, one year before she launches the organization, and Chesterton proved how he saw it all. We are not so very far off from even the sacrifice of babies. If not to a crocodile, at least to a creed. The creed of eugenics, the creed of Darwinism, the creed of Neo-Malthusianism, the creed of overpopulationism, some people are good and some people are bad, so we will position ourselves as the high priests of humanism and decide who lives and who dies. 1920, he writes that in a newspaper in England. Where was the church? What if we had heeded the warnings of G.K. Chesterton, amen? What if the church had cared more about righteousness and the plight of their neighbors than their own comfort and reputation? What if God's people had awakened and realized that the culture war, it was a proxy war? 
It was a proxy war for the deeper spiritual war, but we buried that evil. We convinced ourselves that Christianity had nothing to do with politics. We were like Lot and we wanted a place at the table. We didn't want to be reviled. We wanted to make Christianity in a Rick Warren attractive model. Oops, I just said that publicly. <laughs> we wanted it to be really attractive and not offend the political sensibilities of Christians who need to be called to repentance for supporting the party that's fulfilling Margaret Sanger's vision of slaughtering 65 million image bearers in the womb. So we buried that evil. I'm gonna move this up just a bit where he uh, talks about the white robe White Rose, White Rose Resistance. Member of the White Rose Resistance. But do you understand her brother Hans was just trying to protect his little sister? At 24, at 24 years old, Hans knew that his activity would likely cost him his death. And it did. They spend the rest of 1942 staying up all night, writing, distributing, anti-Nazi leaflets all around Germany. They would stay up all night and take trains to major German cities and drop off these anti-Nazi leaflets. It was a social media campaign before the digital age. Expose the deeds of darkness. Do you see what's happening? Do you see that you'll be the next iteration? And they condemned the crimes of Hitler and mourned the death of the Jews. And in 1943, Hans and Sophie took things to the next level. And on February 18th, 1943, Hans and Sophie, brother and sister, walk onto the campus at the University of Munich. Now, do you understand that the, acad the academic institutions like the clergy were being run by the Nazis? Most of them had been co-opted into obedience or silence. And they begin to distribute their leaflets all around the University of Munich during class time when the halls were quiet. And in this iconic, brave, beautiful scene, Sophie walks to the third floor balcony at the University of Munich, and she throws hundreds of leaflets down to the atrium below. <laughs> Domestic terrorists, right? Now, what happens when you throw paper? It goes everywhere. The janitor catches Sophie and Hans in the act, calls the Gestapo, and has them arrested on the spot. Because they were arrested on February 18th, 1943, they missed a meeting they had that afternoon in Munich with a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who had been so incensed and encouraged by their bravery that he had come to meet with them. Bonhoeffer, the pastor, martyr, prophet, and spy. In those four days in prison, it was as if God entered the cell room of Sophie and Hans picked them up into his hands and condensed their two decades of energy into four days. And Sophie would speak with a level of political vision and clarity that was lost on the German pulpits. So I wanna share with you one of those messages because Sophie is speaking prophetically to us today, church, to stop forgetting the lessons of history, to contend upstream from whence these ideas come and stop picking up the human heartache that we helped create lest you be the next iteration of the ideology of eugenics. Sophie didn't blame the doers of evil, she blamed us. She said the real damage, it's actually caused by all of those millions who just wanna survive. You know, the honest men and women that just want to be left in peace, right? Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear of antagonizing their own weaknesses. Those who don't like to make waves or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principle, it's just literature. Words, right? Like Lot. Oh. Those who live small, die small. It's the reductionistic approach to life. Because if, if you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. If you don't make any noise, the boogeyman won't find you, FBI, Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> but it's all an illusion because they die too. Those people who roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to be safe. Safe from what?
Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets, they lead to the same place as wide avenues. And a little candle burns itself out, just like the flaming torch does. I choose my own way to burn. Um, who talks like that at 21? That sounds like C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, William Wilberforce, or Churchill, for goodness sakes. A young woman with the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring inside of her. A young woman who understood that the culture war was just a proxy war for the spiritual war, and that you're to contend upstream and be the good people who don't just believe the truth, but live the truth. Her courage and calm so disturbed her own prison captors that they relaxed the rules and allowed Hans and Sophie to meet with their parents right before being escorted to the guillotine. And Sophie's mother would look Sophie in the eyes and say, remember Jesus, Sophie. And Sophie replied, yes, but you too, mama. Sophie had a cellmate named Elsie Gebel in her same prison cell who survived the Holocaust and later wrote letters to Sophie's parents explaining every final moment and hour of their daughter's life. And she would tell Sophie's parents that your daughter was not so horrified at her impending death. She was horrified at how her mother could survive losing two children on the same day. And Sophie would lay in her prison cell right before the Nazis would escort her to the guillotine. And according to her cellmate, Elsie Gebel, Sophie would look at her barred window with a little bit of skylight and say, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause. Such a fine sunny day it is, and I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? But brothers and sisters, they never saw thousands awakened and stirred to action. The church remained asleep, the academic institutions remained silent, and the good people wouldn't contend for the rights of the Jews. The executioner would later tell interviewers, she went without the flicker of an eyelash. None of us understood how that was possible. I had never seen someone meet his end as she did. Sophie's final words, according to the executioner before the blade fell, was to say, the sun still shines. And Hans's final words were simply, freedom. Reminds me of Bonhoeffer's final words when he was hung naked at Flossenburg Prison on April 9th, 1945, when he said, this is the end. For me, the beginning of life. So brothers and sisters, I am rebuilding the white rose resistance for this generation against our silent but far more deadly holocaust of abortion to build the army of Christian resistance that Hans and Sophie dreamed of but never saw realized to end the holocaust of our day abortion. But brothers and sisters, while rose blossoms may perish in the fall, they reappear in the spring, amen. And so while all of the members of the White Rose Resistance were found and executed, their sacrifice planted the good seeds of resistance in the cultural soil, and your sacrifice will water the seeds of resistance. So one day, thousands will be awakened and stirred to action. The sun will shine again. Amen. He's just got a couple of, he's, uh, um, talking about his ministry and how they're going to uh, promote it and do it. So, uh, and so the call to action continues. Um, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't slowed down. I know that was a lot, a little long, but, uh, but now you know the, um, a bit of the history and, and the plan of Margaret Sanger and the Eugenic Society and also the Negro Project, about 80% of what uh, he spoke, we've been preaching since about 1990, trying to get especially black pastors in St. Louis City to understand what's going on in their own neighborhoods, 
with the uh, with the abortion clinics, and to join us in our quest um, to fight it and to end it. But much to our dismay, most of them had bought out, which was very very sad. Most of them had bought out to uh, the money that they were getting. Uh, and they would not speak out, and they still don't. So we continue to pray, and we continue to fight. Now, um, a call to action. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Sam. He wants to uh, just share a little bit about what he's doing. And um, we just have a saying, if we go alone, we're going to do God's work. But, um, you know, it's it's more effective for more people, you know, uh, to to do the work. But um, you, we have to do what God has called us to do. And one of them is to support life, like I said, from the cradle to the grave. And that's what we are called to do, along with the ministry that God has called us to do as far as, uh, you know, ha uh, a church. So I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Sam, and uh, he wants to share what he's doing. And uh, you want me to put your picture up, Pastor Sam? Uh, yes, please. Well, basically, it's just pretty simple. It's just uh, keeping it in the forefront and letting everybody kind of know what is going on. I do it on Facebook a lot. And most of the people know we used to go to Planned Parenthood. And uh, what we decided to do is change the name. Uh, well, not so much as change the name, but add the name Pentecostals for Life to Restoration Church. And we're going to start making that kind of a, a push because the uh, the people in the body of Christ, like Pastor Yvonne said at first, the Catholic Church, is very, very known for being pro-life. We know that the people in the Pentecostal church love God and they're just kind of misinformed or the leadership will not let, like Pastor Yvonne again said, let you come into that church to do a presentation like Calvary Chapel is doing. Uh, the Church of God in Christ has a bishop over their organization also, but it's kind of... Well, it's, it's not talked about. It's kind of similar to the Assemblies of God. We have a very good positional paper uh, on uh, the abortion issue and uh, euthanasia and everything, but it's not really talked about a lot. It's kind of a hidden thing there going on. So the main point is to make sure it get out into the public, especially into the body of Christ first, and then from there, uh, we can spread. It don't take a lot of things, you know. You don't have to be a, uh, you know, special <laughs> talent or anything to share uh, about uh, life. Everybody knows that life began at conception, and so what I'm going to do is just take little simple things and be in love and very much love. You have to do it in love and kindness, and that you know and. Uh, that's uh, the Holy Spirit gave me that idea, and it's very, very, very effective in that. You know, and when I go out and drive around in that uh, particular vehicle, that little truck, I have to be ready to talk and to share with people because it really gets their attention. And you guys are all a part of it. You're helping out doing that. Everything that we do in this ministry, you are helping with your fasting and your prayer. So just pray. It's, uh, I get some uh, not too happy looks, you know, it's, uh, some people still think that it, they should be able to do uh, what the young man was talking about, but uh, we don't give up on that. We go out and do what God has called us to do. God has called us to do this particular thing, and I thank God for the Restoration Church who we used to go to Planned Parenthood and really minister, especially to the uh, Sister Joyce, Sister Betty, Sister Linda, Sister Serena, most of the people who know uh, Candace, and all the other folks who uh, 
went to Planned Parenthood in St. Louis. You don't realize how many lives that you save. You're not even worried about that. So when you do things like this, you, you know that it's been effective and God is using you to save lives in that sense. So we're going to start really talking and, uh, for lack of a better word, pushing the Pentecostal should be for life. Life began at conception of that, you know, and you can't get away from that. So and that's one of the things. The church as a whole should be really doing that without being a special ministry. But since it's not, uh, God has called certain people like that young man to do it, and like Sister Connie, and uh, a whole lot of other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue to do that. So we need your prayers for this, uh, what we're doing in that. And thank you. Praise God. Praise God. He uh, also mentioned um, something that, um, you don't hear too much about it now, the uh, uh, embryonic stem cell research mm -hmm. yes. that they were doing. And I remember I made a commercial. Remember the commercial I made? Yes. Mm -hmm. I made, they had me make a commercial against uh, embryonic stem cell research. That was ooh, about 20 years ago. So, but I haven't heard too much about that activity lately. So I'm, I got to kind of investigate that but well, I'm it's wondering... still in effect trust me it's probably in effect like never before they just do not talk about it now they got covers right. you know like the virus and all the other things that is going on so they're not talking about that particular thing you know right but I do want to open it up for a few minutes if anybody had any uh questions about the video or about pro-life uh period or uh, anything surrounding what we talked about today? Anyone? Just him being a good speaker. He really made things very clear and basically told the people that were the cause of starting some of the, uh, I mean, how Margaret Singer started the clinics and all. I. I don't know as I've ever heard that story before. Mm -hmm. So I made about a 25-page uh, a booklet um, on the Negro Project and uh, sent it out to you know people. And, and all of this is old, probably about five years ago I did that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, about 80% of what he shared, uh, some of the names of the people that Margaret Sanger uh, dealt with uh, was new to me, but the basic theory of what she was doing uh, to eliminate um, the unwanted weeds, uh, the unfit, and, um, and to bring in a pure thoroughbred race. That was her thrust. That was her thrust. And like he said, the best way to do this is to put the clinics where they're easily accessible in the black neighborhoods and then have the black pastors assist in doing it. Of course, they would be paid. So, um, you know, when you think about that, it, it's just terrible. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pat. Any other questions? And comment? I would also like to just comment right. the majority of the, the so-called <laughs> Christian church or voting, like he was saying, you shouldn't vote for a person that is wanting abortion. But the majority of the Christian church by four vote for the Democratic Party. You have to say the name of the party. I'm not trying to insult anybody who may be a Democrat, but it is the Democratic Party that is heavily pushing for abortion. And the majority of the Christian church, the denominations, or voting uh, for, I think it's about 61 to 70 percent who vote for the Democratic Party, knowing that they are voting to kill babies in the womb in that sense, and, you know. Yeah. And the, it's also another way of controlling the population. The population is at a 1.6 percent growth now. In order for a country or a nation to keep going, it has to be about 2.9 or something like that. 
So what is happening now is the country in a, say, we're going to have start some serious problems in the year, say, 240, if, if the rapture does not happen before Amen. that. I'm hoping that it does. But uh, because of uh, the, the push not to have kids, the selfishness of not taking care of kids, <clears throat> the push for abortion, in that sense, it's kind of really penetrating the country right now. And I really believe that our country is going to come on a even more serious uh, judgment than what we're already coming on now because of our attitude. And as the, the scripture says, judgment started at the house of God. The Amen. church is very much asleep when it comes to the abortion issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that uh, we are at, uh, the black population is at zero, uh, minus zero population growth. That means that we are dying faster than we are right. uh, reproducing, ourselves. reproducing ourselves. Mm -hmm. That don't last too long. Uh, someone was about to say something, I think. I was going to say that she made it a point to talk about taking out, I guess, the minorities, the misfits and uh, the children like the mongoloid children or the uh, mm -hmm. whatever children that have defects. But not one time did she mention her own race and want to say that she wanted to take out any of them unless she was including those in the. But uh, well, they like would be the, the misfits. Yeah. Retarded or the ones right. that had the. Uh, defects as far as mongoloid babies or whatever uh, other deformities they would have. So she did include them, I guess. She, in that wasn't, ra she wasn't racist. That, and that's, uh, that's a known fact that mm -hmm. she was a racist from the heart. You know, uh, she got most of her information and her uh, influence from Hitler uh, and other, you know, racist people back there. So she was well fed in the area of hate. Uh, she was a bitter woman. She, like he said, she slept around. She was, she was very, you know, she. Well, she basically was just used by the devil. She was evil was and she was. She, she was, was basically devil. used 100% by the devil in that sense. She yeah. was, uh, right. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. was, uh, she was very evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, the, the devil, like Pastor Sam said, the devil just really used her. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I had a question. Um, when he was talking about the selective sterilization, um, was that like a particular age group or were they just going after people of color in general? No, not just necessarily people of color. Like Pat said, people who had defects. In other words, if, uh, if a young lady went to the doctor uh, and they told her that, um, and they still do it. They, they do it at Barnes and all of uh, Mercy Hospital. Uh, well, you know, you might want to think about you know, having an abortion because your baby is going to be born with this or that or that, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, they will have her, you know, in uh, a, a, a very young lady who is not thinking straight or not a Christian, don't understand. Uh, will be pressured into having an abortion because uh, the baby might not be what is deemed perfect by society. Mm -hmm. So that's selected, mm -hmm. right? And let uh, me let me oh, add yeah. while you're doing that. Let me uh, put in a little bit <laughs> while you add to that question right there. And also back in that particular time period, in the '40s and the '50s and the '60s, they were uh, also uh making the young ladies, I don't know how you ladies would put it, uh, mm -hmm. fixing where they would not have babies in that sense. And that, you know. And then what happened in the 50s and the 60s, they really start encouraging married people, and especially married people of, of what you uh color to really get their tubes tied so they would not have any more babies one or two babies in that, you know. All but right. the big lie said you can make a lot of money if you just have 1.6 baby in that. Yeah, I don't know how you have 1.6 baby, but the, that's the basically what, uh, if you just got one kid, then you can uh, have all the other stuff that you have in this world for yourself, you know. 
And that's a basically another selfish, ungodly kind of attitude in that. Okay, anyone else? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, well, I hope it was uh, informative enough uh, for you to just really pray about getting involved in any way that you can. If it's no more than, uh, you know, just sharing with someone the atrocity um, behind abortion, uh, sterilization, and all of that, uh, um, you know, all of it's bad and all of it's terrible. Mm -hmm. So in, in other words, get the word out however mm -hmm. you can. If you want some material, we got plenty uh, mm -hmm. we can send you. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got to get busy. Share the next battlefield I'm, before you so close, gonna, Betty, about, about the appeal coming up. Okay. Uh, let me turn this off here. This one's trying to, I forgot to turn that off.